Hello everybody, welcome to another practicing session. Still here in this uh, uh, not definitive setup, I would say, with my awkward chair. Definitely not to recommend to practice. It's actually uh, something that you should never should do practicing in this chair like that. It's, it, 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 it has a lot of negative uh, side effects. But my uh, chair belonging to the clavichord here is still at home because we recorded Alberto and I the fifth symphony again and that we need two, chair, two chairs for that. I should have another one here um, at the clavichord. So this is it for this is the setting for now. I am recording this practicing session not uh, long after the one that we uh, finished um, at during the last uh, practicing session, which was the which was the B flat minor fugue. Let's not talk too fast. And also these wooden beams, don't worry. I know many of you are concerned that I would damage my clavichord, but I'm not damaging my clavichord with this, but I will find a definite setup also for the light here. So um, I had a Zoom meeting, as you will remember at the end of that practicing session where my phone, uh, the alarm on my phone uh, warned me for that. And now after the Zoom meeting, I'm going to return, I'm returning to the clavichord with this B flat minor prelude, which has similar challenges compared to the fugue in terms of position, hand position at the clavichord, and um, in terms also of sound. So hand position on the clavichord and sound goes hand in hand. Certainly B flat minor is a key in which you will come across hand positions that are very far remote from what is quote unquote normal fingering patterns. You have to um, allow yourself for quite some um, exceptions. And on the clavichord, this, the clavichord often says no to that. So it's the B flat minor piece is quite challenging. But for the fugue, I was very happy. If you haven't seen that practicing session, it's just in the playlist right before this one. And I was very happy because there at the end, we came to a situation where in fact, with a little bit more relaxed feeling in the wrist, so meaning also the releases were more relaxed, we created a kind of more legato, cantabile legato sound, which allows me to, which allowed me to play the piece much easier. Also, allowing me, myself, uh, the long notes which has which has slurs that have slurs, to um, just play again, which is normal practice in those days, but not, maybe not always for fugues, you know. So I was a little bit reluctant to do that before. In previous recordings, you won't hear me do that, I think, a lot. But it allowed me to, when it just allowed me to do that, it relaxed the hand position a little bit. And that made, created a more beautiful sound. And in a way also, it made the piece more transparent, which in this case, it's maybe more an organ piece than really a keyboard piece, created also the opportunity to have the long notes, which have slurs, actually emphasized in a way that on a, on a keyboard like this, this a clavichord, um, made sense and also enhanced the structure of the piece. So I'm, but I'm curious to see if that approach is if that approach in this B flat minor prelude also works. So same thing as with the fugue, and always I'm preparing for the recording now the well tempered clavier, the well tempered keyboard. With in, in within a few, not even a few months, next month I should be already recording. The release is planned for the first half of um, 2022 already, yes. And so I'm really excited to do that. And it's, Alberto and I set the recording dates, not the recording dates, but the release dates. And so that implies obviously the recording dates and it's actually great, it's a great feeling that I will be recording during one month, probably, again at the clavichord. Has been a while, eh? Has been a while. So, what temperature clavier is coming? 
And after that, I mean, the partitas will be re-recorded, but I'm also dying to do the Mozart sonatas, uh, all of them. But that's for later. Having said all of that, let's go to the uh, Prelude in B-flat minor and see how we can uh, clear the table of most of the things that I did in the past by just starting to play very slowly, focus on sound, focus on cantabile, and in this case also on the releases are critical to make that happen. So let's press this button here and normally you should see my score. By the way, let me know in the description box if this really is a very nice setup for you and view allowing you to see the score. You might not hear that, but when I talk, the clavichord is uh, respond responding to me. It's like unbelievable how the soundboard just is in a complete dialogue with me. Even during a recording that you should actually be silent a little bit. The clavichord is like, yeah. For those of you who play the clavichord, you know what I'm talking about. It's such an intimate bond between the player and the instrument. It's uh, kind of unique. Okay, there we go. Already, this is such a difficult position. If you see that from above, yeah, you can see it's a little bit dark now. I should, yeah. And it's, this position is something you want to avoid because it's very hard to make sound. And if you want to make sound, you have to give a little bit more sound, more decibel, so to say. You almost get an accent there, and it's maybe not what you want, huh? or do you? Do we? It's possible there, then, but... This... This note here, and with this fingering, so 3-2... I could use, I could play it with five here. You see, but that, those are the exceptions I'm, I was talking about in this, in this key. So I wouldn't be surprised if also this piece was transposed by Bach. And again, I don't know the history of the, of individual pieces of the World Temple Clavier. I should read about that cannot do everything at the same time. So if you know that, just let the community know and let the community know in the description box uh, what's the history of this B-flat minor. I'm, I'm pretty interested in knowing that because it's a very remote key for that time. Huh? And certainly in this position. First finger needs to be on the, on the, on the G-flat. And there's a reason why that was avoided as much as possible because then your hand turns and you don't have the ideal hand position anymore. So if I go to five, I avoid this position, but what then? Or three, two. It's both possible, eh? So I'm going to I'm I will add a five there and see yeah what I leave it a little bit to the to what works best five and then again in any case four two and on the next note that's something that's necessary here so. And then I have four, two, one. Okay, my original fingering is that I help the right hand here. It's maybe not necessary. I don't think this is necessary. So the E flat, yes, but the E flat we already had here. So
So I will also take that with the second finger, by the way. Now do this. As I said before, the, the old trick, like with old teachers, I don't know old teachers, I'm sorry if you still do it to get, because I, I say old teacher like back in the days, maybe today still there is a tradition in doing that. Putting a pencil in front of the uh, black keys, in this case white keys, is actually a very good practice. You should make sound here and on the clavichord you kind of have to. That's not possible always with these remote keys. So uh, that's what I'm fighting against a little bit. actually works fine. Might be a forte be beginning, like very soft. Do not hear that in this camera, in this microphone. Then this becomes really difficult. I have to jump from the A to the B flat with the same finger and in order to not make it sound like this I have to be careful the release of my second finger that's nice so actually I can play a piano but I wonder if a forte opening would not look, make sense. It's very dramatic with this repeated B flat. This very long F starts in the in this bar goes up to that bar. So maybe I can just repeat that there. Or one more time. And then here again. Or maybe it's too much. Let's see. Okay, we'll go from here. Uh, relaxed. This is a very difficult position as well. I mean, this hand position is not what you want. You want to have this hand position. Quality of sound is here great. I don't know if these microphones pick the difference. The attack is different. This is very smooth, like round. This is more square don't know how to pronounce how to call it differently so the position of your hands for those of you who don't play clavichord clavichord players will know that james is the sound and here i'm forced in this position and those notes are very high so very short strings so what would be still easier here is very difficult there the higher you go the more you're, you're punished as a player for wrong hand position, wrong finger position, wrong way of playing or approaching the note. So here's, and it's, you're exposed right here. See? That's nice. <laughs> the problem, let's say the challenge here is, just checking on the computer. The challenge here is that it's not only this note, you have to move forward to this one. And this is even worse. This position is worse because now I have, let's say on the piano it's a white key. And I don't, I cannot play it here. 
after plate here. But how to release from here to this with my fifth finger there? So let's try this to play forte and maybe that will work. But I have to be careful not to stress here because so that means firm attack from the arm weight not much finger speed here release of the tension there is no tension it's just weight release of the weight immediately transferring the weight to these two keys but then give the F most of the weight because otherwise it will not sound and you will hear tack and now granted in the recording you can fix everything eh? let's not pretend we don't if you if you would buy the recording when it when it's uh, released you don't want to hear this f with tack every time so don't worry it will sound fine but i won't I want to be able to do it every time and this is this is a passage that I struggled with along with that for quite a time so that's the reason why I said at the beginning it's a little bit of a challenge this piece but it needs to be fixed second finger stays on the D flat eh? we are not going to use substitutions we don't do that not dogmatic it makes your life easier. But this piece is a little too complex to explain that. Here also. Also notice this accent, very natural accent we have on every second eighth note. Here, so on the downbeat, one, two, one, two, one, two. It's really beautiful. This piece is so unbelievable. Eh? So, we try piano. I have this lamento feeling. And I know the tempo is different now. So if you say like, you have in the tempo ordinario, all this stuff, what's, you change, change, change your temper now, so what's, First of all, this is a very complex piece. The notation is here very complex. It is not like a standard common time piece. And the slider, the tempo slider around the tempo ordinario here is determined by how much do you want to emphasize this, the apparent, the obvious accentuated downbeat. If you decide to do, if, if I would decide to have that emphasized a lot or quite a lot um, yeah then the tempo goes down there is you you, you you cannot fight your pulse then because then you are and I guess today there are musicians who want to do that like keep the pulse and have the accent at the same time no it goes hand in hand and that adds to the, that then the correct character changes it has a huge implication So we're still in the, in, in the realm of tempo ordinario, I would say, but you see that a similar or a time signature 
the use of that is expanded. You don't have 8-8, eight, eight, huh? Which, which, which we would, I'm playing it now in what you could say, let's say 8-8, eight, eight, but that time signature was never developed. So when Bach wanted to have this kind of adagio feeling, then he had not a time signature available to, 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 to really express that. By the way, the Tovi or what, what is that? It, those are old traditions, I mean, which is sometimes interesting to see. Lento. Not that it's important, huh? I don't know what Czerny gives. This is metronome, by the way. We can check later if we want. But for the for the recording and clavichord, I certainly will check Czerny. I mean, it's, an, it's a source. But uh, he didn't make those metronome marks for a clavichord. But anyways, that's for that's for another time. left hand should be a little bit more prominent from the moment that it starts to lead to have its own life now it's just here the bass just having the repeated notes as to the drama but here let's try to give it a little bit more attention it's not particularly a joyful piece eh? Certainly here, eh? this gives an accent, this harmonic change. Now when you have an accent there, you are accentuating an eighth note, a second eighth note of the third beat, meaning you're playing in an eight-eight structure. I'm not saying that's the correct tempo, but and maybe it can be a little bit faster. I actually don't know what tempo that I have now, but I can definitely see this piece to get to work eh? in, this, in this way. John. Around 60 for the eighth note. So compared to Chenny, Chenny would be slower than, huh? it would be 92 in single beat, but we know the story around that, huh? don't we? So let's actually see what this tempo is. I'm now a little bit intrigued. Guys, for, for, for complex structures like this, I mean, it cannot harm to just check on 
Mr. Chinese Tempe, yeah, even at I mean in the inventions he's we saw it in the comparisons. I'm not saying you have to follow him, but uh, I should check also if that I mean those if that is correct, but I guess uh, 92. Striking is that 92 eighth note journey apparently is the same as uh, who metronomized this. I mean, this is the Dover edition, which is basically a reprint of the uh, of the first um, Bach edition, 19th century. But uh, it's a very good edition. I mean, it's not saying that it's the uh, it's the ultimate edition. So there are metronomized bishop. 
So I don't know if this shop is single beat or whole. I mean, we should. It would be interesting to uh, to just take a deeper look on that, but not in this project. Uh, but I just see the correlation here. That's uh, that's interesting, right? I don't see 92 single beat here to be lento. But that's another point. That's another discussion. But I see this this tempo makes an impression. Creates an atmosphere that's really like you don't want to. You, you want to stay a little bit of uh, you know a little bit silent there afterwards. And I have time to make sound. So interesting, right? Here the C is tight. how this worked different now. What I did differently was um, have less accents or emphasis on the second eighth note but much more on the fourth and it gives the energy. Here, it's composed like that.
there is a foundation there, it's not yet there. It's a little bit all over the place. But I can definitely see this piece in this temple. I'm not saying that I'm going to record it like that. Again, I should try it on the piano. It's a future project, actually, also. But um, it makes sense also here. I'm not, I'm not even sure that I'm still in 92 here, but I mean, this is kind of eighth note slow tempo. You have time here. Exclamatio, I like it. Response. Response. Question, actually. Other question. Other question. Big question mark. Going hand in hand together. Got to get together. Solution. Follow up. So we have the time to really put in the spotlights every note here from the follow up. You just continue. It's more relaxed. There's this tension. difficulty here is that the, the two middle voices are released. The upper voice, however, is a start of something new. So, pom, 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 pom. the left hand should be very light. It's difficult. Difficult release, eh?
this is definitely some work, but um, you can see this piece work like that. I might have sped up now a little bit, I don't know, let's check. What do you think? Did I follow the 92 journey or did I just sped up more or less to my previous tempo? So, might be an interesting exercise for you to do right now as well. I'm going to check, you might pause the video and just check for yourself. Let's come up with a solution. So I would have, I would, was playing around 52 now, a little bit faster on Chinese 46 in, uh, in single beat notation. Um, but it's there, huh? I definitely think that is in the right direction. I have to say, if you go on, on the channel, um, you will, um, that's easy playing in the, in the chair like this, you can <laughs> actually relax a little bit. It's not, definitely not, not good for your back. So. There is a recording on my channel. I'm not sure it's still um, there because I re-recorded this piece later. One of the first recordings I made, I think it's, it's, it was made on, the, on another clavichord and this, my clavichord was at Judas Potfliegis workshop for some maintenance on that, I think. I think I had his clavichord at my place back then. Anyways. Quite a, quite a while ago, when I played, where I played this much, much, much faster, I was really puzzled by the notation. I mean, we're speaking about 2014 now, and I can see why. I mean, everybody would say like, "Yeah, this guy talks about the tempo denario, and now he comes in the world tempo denario is a piece that um, that led to multiple interpretations." Yes, already Bach is. Uh, using, it's expanding the use of the time signatures and just half a century later people would beg for a device that gives an accurate exact tempo. Uh, so it's not so surprising that already in this kind of pieces you can kind of feel that. And so I was playing that, that much faster but fighting something that actually I already back then felt in a way. And then I made a second recording of which I really don't know anymore. It's in the playlist of the World Tempered Clavier. What tempo I took, I have no idea. You see there are some marks here, really fast. 2009 I was playing, I was really playing almost 92 eighth note. And I got a lot of critics, criti critical voices for that recording. People even calling me like, why did you play it that fast? It's strange, huh? <laughs> when you play a Beethoven piece slower, people say, oh, you play so slow. When you play a Bach piece much faster like this, like, and they were right. So, and also technically it was not, it was almost not possible to play the chord. But this gives, this gives, this tempo that's right to the, the composed emphasis on at least the last eighth note of the bar. I think when this piece would have been composed in, in 1780 or in later, I mean, by Haydn, Mozart or Beethoven, this would have been in 2-4, in the sense of 4-8, which 2-4 became more and more with two, two uses of 2-4. Of and as you have two uses, such so usages, is that something you say of 4-4, four, four. it's going to be an 8-8. Eight, eight. And the confusion was because there were no twenty second notes, but harmonically it's there. I'm reading Quans the other day, reading through it again, and it's striking. I mean, it's a very, very interesting source actually, very practical. And he also says that an orchestra leader should be able to play any piece in the correct tempo. Surprise, I mean, Quans speaks about a correct tempo. If you say that, to people today, like Beethoven, play Beethoven, the correct tempo, which is then the metronome mark indicated by him or by his uh, disciples, you know, like Francis Czerny, say, ah, oh, it's free, it's all that. But there are no, not many sources that say you can come up with whatever tempo you have. But anyways, regardless of that. And he talks about harmonic density. And it's, it's definitely applicable to this piece, in spite of the fact not having 30 second notes, very open notation, and you would say in, in terms of uh, common time, I mean, 
if you, if you look at the, at, at the piece again, it has 16th notes, yes, but it's the 16th notes are carriers of the tension to the next beat, so to say. They're not, they're structural, they need, they deserve attention in the way that structural note means you give them the, the attention they, they need for clarity, for articulation, so that they are in the layer where the player, where you as a player actually can play them as exactly as you want. If they're ornamental, I'm not saying you should play, you, you, you should get um, uh, loose to control over the, what you are doing, but it's, it's a layer that's a little bit less important. Here, every tiny bit of articulation makes a difference in playing the notes, and that certainly is the case here with the 16th notes, but there are no 16th notes all over the place. And so, going back to, to 2009 even, was, I had my clavichord, 20 August 2009, my clavichord was one week old or something. <laughs> Incredible. Time just flies. But that's a, how long I played this piece. Didn't know that actually. But um, I mean, I can understand why I was a little bit not confused by why I took the decision. But honestly, I was never happy about it. And um, I understand now why. So, okay, guys, it was a little bit of a mixed practicing session and also diving into the notation. And during these sessions, I'm sharing with you my allowing you so to say into my kitchen when I'm where I'm cooking and I'm deciding like should I should I add a little bit of pepper or salt to do some take some other herbs and the foundation is there but there are so many options you still can take even when I would decide upon this temple which probably I will I will do I will definitely go in that direction then in this foundational layer of movement you have so many options to take and it's not that when you play a piece very long of this nature that everything is solved. Again, I'm going to make a recording, so I'm going to take a decision. But there are other directions, obviously, that you can take this piece into, certainly a piece like that. And, and then it's sometimes, I mean, the evolution that led to the metronome is so easy to understand when you read Again, Quans, like a good orchestra leader, should be able to play any piece in any style, starting with the correct tempo. And then he, he says that you actually feel that. You can see it. You, you know when you're experienced, when you heard a lot of musicians play, when you're overstepping these boundaries, when you're going into an area where you do damage to the piece. And from that regard, I mean, from that perspective, it's bad normal that 50 years later people will quite work or were begging for a device for ac accurate tempo because the complexity of this, I mean, there are pieces that you can say, okay, there is a certain natural movement, certainly if you dive into the tempo ordinary world, that um, you start to develop a little bit. And But there are pieces like this that just takes you outside that or go put you on the limit and then it would have been very nice if Bach just would have given Pendulum a tempi for this but he did it and so there are the margins it's a fascination of uh, even when you consider the tempo ordinario to be the starting point anyways enough of this lecture I'm going to leave you here with this thought thank you for your attention next time hopefully on a better bench than this one and if you have any questions, of course, leave them in the comment section. I'm not promising that I read everything, but when I come across a very interesting question or something like that, I might just make a video on your question. As already now, I think you have seen the video, how do I do my, my clavichord? Or better, do I read you my clavichord for every Bach piece that I'm playing? The answer definitely was no. And the reasons why, I explained to you in that video. And if you want to know that, those reasons, you have to go click on the video and watch. I think it's interesting if you're dealing with temperaments and keyboard instruments in general. Okay, enough for today. Thanks for watching. See you soon again.